But first, Joe Biden is desperately fighting to keep his presidential candidacy alive, but the unyielding support he once enjoyed from the US media has dissipated. Today, he spoke at NATO during a lengthy press conference where he trailed off numerous times and made some incredibly damaging gaffes. Look, I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president, but I think she was not qualified to be president. So let's start there. And journalists were having none of it. Nearly every question involved bewilderment at why Biden was still in the race. Our political future has hung over the NATO summit a little bit this week. You mixed up uh, Presidents uh, Zelensky and Putin earlier today. But what makes this moment in history so unique is that it is not your enemies who are calling on you to reconsider your decision to stay in the race. It's your friends, supporters, people who think you've done a great job. And after a while, it started to get weird. He does this thing where he whispers, and I'm not sure exactly what he thinks it sounds like, but it's bad. When unions do better, everybody does better. Everybody does better. And we talk about how, for example, when I went, but they add things, add things all the time, at the very end, it's not going to happen. No one's saying that. But if you think the NATO press conference was bad, take a look at the moment he confused the leader of Ukraine with Vladimir Putin. And now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. It's no wonder that even the New York Times is now campaigning for Biden to step down. Biden advises Way how to convince him to end his campaign. Close allies of the president are developing a case for why he should step aside. But Mr Biden is increasingly isolated. Now, part of the concern is that Biden's crack-addled, convicted felon son, Hunter Biden, has started to appear in Oval Office meetings. And the press is not too happy about this. So, Kevin McCarthy just said that when he was the speaker, many times when we had meetings in the Oval Office, Jill was there as well. When the First Lady is in these meetings, is she making decisions or is she no. just advising the President? No. The President is the President of the United States. He makes decisions. Okay. Another family member. President Biden has told me before he and his son don't have any business dealings together. So what is Hunter Biden doing in White House meetings? Are you talking about the meeting where they came together from Camp David and the two of them walked to the President's meeting and he was there? There's a report that aides were struck by his presence during their discussions. Look, I can't, I'm, I'm certainly not going to get into uh, private conversations that, are, that occur. What I can say is, and I talked to this, I spoke to this before, is that uh, when they came back from Camp David, the president spent a, a couple days at Camp David with his family. Uh, he is very close to your, his family, as you know. It was the week of 4th of July, which is why his family members were here last week. They walked together, and they walked together into uh, the meeting. Can you say if Hunter Biden has access to classified information? No. Well, let's bring in media writer at The Australian, Sophie Ellsworth, and Sky News contributor, James Bolt. James, let's start with you. Great to have you here. Thank you. This was his opportunity to dispel all of the conjecture about his cognitive decline, which is obvious to us. How did it go? I think that he's done enough to buy him some time. Like, I know all the gaffes we just saw there, uh, the needless, aggressive way he was dealing with the once-friendly press. Um, my favourite one was when he said that uh, he's started scheduling fundraisers earlier in the day, not for him, but for everyone else, because he wants other people to be able to go home at 10. Like, the defence of, I'm not tired, you guys are all <laughs> tired, so you guys can leave me alone. I think the issue is, though, like, when he calls Zelensky Putin, when he calls Kamala Harris Trump, how much of that is already priced into Joe Biden, the candidate? Like, who was surprised that he would do that? And the people around him right now, the senior Democrats calling on him to either stay or go, they're not there out of the love of country, they're not there out of a dedication to public service, they're there for Team Blue. And if Biden's the guy that's going to win for Team Blue this November, Biden stays. And the problem for them is that they don't have like a 92 Clinton or an 08 Obama in the wings because if they did, today, Trump, uh, said today Biden would be somewhere yelling at nurses that his coffee's too hot. 
the fact is, Biden's still the best they've got, and uh, unless the polls tell you otherwise, he's going to stay on. Yeah, and the other thing is, I think you raise a really good point about the gaffes being bad, but he's been doing this for three years, and Sophie, I'd love to bring you in. I think there is a degree of now these journalists have been exposed, they're covering themselves because it is unavoidable. But to James's point, he's been doing this for a long time. There's nothing that significantly an outlier. Why now all the pressure? Why now? I think now, because he has got his own people internally turning on him, Jack, and also that presidential uh, debate a few weeks ago was an absolute disaster and the media couldn't shy away from that. So now they actually have egg on their face because I would argue uh, the antics of... Uh, President Biden at various media calls and appearances is not that different to what he was like 12, 18, 24 months ago. But suddenly the media pack, predominantly in the US and also here in Australia, has woken up and said, we have a problem on our hands. So I don't think President Biden will be going anywhere. But the media has been exposed, I believe, for not calling this out earlier. And now it appears that they're playing catch up in the lead up to the presidential election later this year. Yeah, really well said. Not all journalists, though, are playing that game and some are still covering for the president and some are more subtle than others. Radio host Andrea Lawful Sanders lost her job at WRD Radio after admitting her post-debate interview with President Joe Biden was based on questions the Biden camp fed her. Andrea, let me ask you here uh, about uh, your interviews and something I listened to both of them. And there's something that's similar here. You each were uh, you asked four questions and maybe that's what you were allowed to ask by uh, the campaign or the White House. But they were essentially the same questions, both interviews about accomplishments, progress in your respective state, what's at stake in the election, what he has to say about his debate performance and what he would say to voters who think uh, their vote doesn't matter or might sit this election out. Were those questions given to you by the White House or did you have or the campaign or did you have to submit questions ahead of this interview? The questions were sent to me for approval. I approved them. And it gets worse. A radio show in Milwaukee was one of the first places to get a post debate interview with Biden. And shockingly, the White House asked them to edit the interview to make him look sharper. CNN reports a Milwaukee radio station agreed to make two edits to an interview recorded with President Joe Biden earlier this month at the request of his campaign, the station's owner, Civic Media, which said on Thursday. Now, let's bring the panel back in. James, uh, both egregious situations. Now, this isn't me saying, hey, I plan on asking these questions, which is bad. I'm not saying that's acceptable. This is the Biden camp saying you may only ask him one of these questions. Yeah. Put that to one side. Then you've got other people editing him. And the, the background, the context of this is they're doing these interviews to show the American people that he is cognitively there. So not only is it a lie, but contextually it is a lie that is extremely important. See, this is what infuriates me so much that the media this week has decided that they can start talking about Biden's decline. These are two terrible examples, but these cannot be the only examples in the his, uh, in the four yep. years of the Biden presidency of this going on. But now it's OK to say, actually, yeah, six months ago, you know, that I had an interview with him. It was weird. That is not on. This is a press pack that for four years has either been outright lying to us or at the very best going along willingly with the narrative the Democratic Party is saying. Because we've heard, oh, but, you know, there's the weird clips of him, but behind closed doors, he's doing skateboard tricks and reciting sonnets backwards like <laughs> and the media was like oh well i'll, I'll take that yeah I'll, you know press send on that copy it, it's a complete lie they've been caught out now because the truth is in front of us after this debate and their reputation's at stake because how can we trust anything that people have been saying biden's healthy biden's healthy biden's healthy but here's my point on another issue sorry you're the guy that said biden's healthy we don't trust you anymore yeah it's a really good point sophie institutional trust in general has been on the decline it's something that we know. How much has this whole saga damaged the credibility of the institutional media, the journalists who sit there? I, I take a point that um, 
make the point that Peter Ducey in the front row from Fox News, he's consistently been asking quite provocative questions. He's someone that's quite a good operator there. But the pack in general has really been running a protection racket for this man and this presidency. It's the opposite of, you know, holding power to account. They're really protecting him. Why are they doing that? And how much damage has this caused their credibility? I think it's caused immense damage to the media's integrity and also they're doing this because a large contingency of the media, not just in Australia, not just in the US but around the world, is left-leaning and they want to be players. Uh, they don't want to do their jobs. They want to come in and be advocates and activists. Unfortunately, the media industry is seeing more of this. However, I would argue that Joe Biden needs to front the cameras and needs to do more live TV so we can see him for what he is. Forget the teleprompters, forget the transcripts, uh, and that's what we saw in the in the debate with Donald Trump, where it was an absolute dog's breakfast because he couldn't cope under that situation. Uh, the man is 81; uh, he'll be 82 in November, uh, possibly 86 if he wins his next term by the time he ends. So if he's like this now, I think there's a pretty uh, rocky road ahead until November, and if he is the presidential candidate and does win, I think this is incredibly concerning for America and the world. Yeah, it's a really good point.